All right, Brian Foreman, welcome to the Build It Better podcast, brother. I'm so excited you're here. Thanks for coming. Hey, thanks for the invitation. Looking forward to it. Yeah, man. So um, I, I, it's been fun to be able to do this by Zoom, even though we're not that far separated. But welcome to my studio. What do you think? It's fantastic. I, I, I need to know if there are prints available for the art I'm seeing on the wall. These are priceless, man. These prints right here, they, uh, you know, I had this bare wall for a, for a while and my kids thought, you know, dad, like you need some artwork for your walls. And so it literally goes up even higher, but um, yeah, it's really spiced up the place. Don't you think? <laughs> it's nice. Uh, you know, all the colors work well together. They tie in. Um, it's, it's nice. Un unlike the refrigerator that's behind me that you can't stick anything to. So. I don't know, but that looks pretty good though. Um, it's got me wondering what's in there. So, uh, well, thanks for coming on, man. So I'm, you know, you and I have known each other for a number of years and I've been, I love our conversations every time. So I thought I'd get one recorded and see where we go with it. But before we jump in, I'd love for you to kind of introduce yourself, tell our listeners a little bit about you, what you're up to these days, and just kind of give them a little bit of backstory, maybe about just you personally. Um, sure. So I am, um, I guess from a professional perspective, I work at Campbell University. I'm the executive director of community engagement and leadership for the university. I also direct a, a program uh, called the Center for Church and Community, where we try to encourage and teach clergy and congregations how to create positive community impact. Uh, so that's a lot of fun, but that's what keeps me busy during the day. Uh, otherwise, I'm, I'm um, husband to Denise and father of a 21-year-old and a 17-year-old. So I've got a a rising senior in college and a rising senior in high school and had, uh, have no idea how that happened. Um, <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I know how they got here. I was going to say, I, oh, I, really? <laughs> I, I just, I can't believe that they're, that, that both of them have had these milestone events coming next year. So uh, it's just really remarkable. Uh, so that's a little bit about who I am. I'm otherwise just, uh, you know, somebody who's hanging around the community and trying to meet people like yourself. Yeah, I don't know about that, but thank you, brother. There's um, there's a few things in that in that intro that are the reasons why I wanted to talk with you today. And you touched on parenting, you touched on leadership, you touched on community engagement and building relationships, and those are all things that um, that are important to me. Those are things that I like to talk about. And so, um, for anybody that'll have those conversations with me, like I get excited. And so, you and I have you know off the air had conversations like that in the past, and so. That'd be fun to dive in them today. So let's start with the parenting piece. So how are you, how are you dealing with, uh, with the kids hitting those milestones? What's it like for you? Because I'm on that other side of that, right? I've got a six-year-old and a three-year-old, but I know it's coming. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, what's amazing about it is that we've had such very different experiences with both of our kids. <clears throat> I mean, you know, we talk about anybody that's had two kids in their house knows that you can do exactly the same thing and they both do very, <laughs> become very different people. Absolutely. Um, our oldest, when Brock was preparing to graduate high school, was still very much a homebody. Really was, his best friend was up the street, everything sort of gravitated towards that area. So, so we weren't quite prepared for the, the, the new sound of our house when he left. We, we just weren't prepared for it to be three of us in the house anymore. Um, now, our daughter, as soon as she could get her driver's license, she got it. I mean, Brock still doesn't have his. He's a junior. Oh, wow. He just finished his junior college, has no interest in driving, and we're all better off for it. Um, <laughs> he, he's a thinker. He just wants to be in his head, and, and that, that doesn't work well when you're, <laughs> when you're driving. So, uh, so anyway, but, but Adria, on the other hand, she is, she is all about being her own person, being on the go, staying busy. She's been like that since she was you know, in preschool, she wanted to schedule a play date. She wanted to go play at somebody's house. She wanted to go do this. She wanted to go do that. And so that, that's still who she is today. And, and so there are, before this pandemic hit, um, we were, we being Denise and I, were getting very used to the silence of just the two of us in the house, as opposed to that third person uh, always around. So she's preparing us better for the empty nest experience than, mm -hmm. <laughs> than Brock ever did. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's so gratifying to see your kids become their own people. Uh, we used to joke with them and still do to some extent saying that you were temporary residents in our house. You know, when one, one of the, when one of them would want to try to get Denise or I on their side of a discussion that the two of them were having, um, it always made sense to remind them, look, after you leave, I still have to live with her. Yes. <laughs> you, you, you're a visitor right? You, you got an 18 year visitor pass to our house. After I love that, that. We're raising you to be independent and on your own. And, 
and, and I'm thrilled that, that our kids had that. Uh, at the same time, it's, it's also sad. You know, you, you recognize, crap, I've done what I set out to do with them in this regard, and, um, and there's not as much need for me. There's a, there is a need, but it's very different. And so trying to figure out how to live into that and be a good parent in the next stage of life uh, for our kids is, is a challenge. Uh, and, and, you know, you find those exemplars to lean on, people who you've seen that have done it and from the outside at least seem to have done it well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I've been pretty fortunate to, to have those folks that I've been able to watch through the years uh, and, and pick their brains about how do you do this? Um, how, how do you be, how do you maintain this, relationship with your child that doesn't put you in the position of being their friend. You're always still the parent, but it also doesn't put you in the role of adversary because ultimately you, you ultimately I, I want to be friends with my kids um, as adults, but they need a parent. They, they need me to be parent more than they need to need to be a friend. Uh, and so how do you balance that mm. without coming off as a tyrant or, um, <laughs> or, or any of the things that we might have called our parents or my kids may have even called me but <laughs> behind my back, but, but how do you, how do you do that? And so I've been fairly fortunate to have people who have helped me see that. Yeah. So what are the steps on how you do that? Because I'm taking notes right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's so, I mean, you know, it's going to sound like it's so trite, the, 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 these pieces, one of them is to know which battles to fight. True. Uh, I think that's been huge for us. Um, my wife and I have different personalities. We have different styles. We, we may disagree, but if we don't disagree in front of the kids, we, we, will, we, will have, we will support each other if one of us makes a decision, even if we don't necessarily agree with it, and then we'll have a conversation later, Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, which, which usually means that I've done something wrong. <laughs> that's what that boils down to. I know that goes. Uh, but the fun of it is, uh, you know, it also plays into the sense of humility with your kids. Um, we knew very early on that our oldest was was just ridiculously smart. And I don't say that as a bragging parent or anything like that, because uh, there there are challenges that go along with whatever personality type or a child exhibits. There's always going to be struggles. Um, there's those things to celebrate, but then there are those things that are like, okay, how do we help navigate this? But in realizing that, it also meant that just because or I said so were never going to be satisfactory answers. They could solve them. They could solve it in the moment, but they weren't good long-term solutions in parenting. So that really re- required a pretty significant amount of humility as a parent with our kids. Um, there are plenty of times that, that I screwed up. There are plenty of times that I went to my kids and said, hey, I didn't handle this correctly. Um, I need you to, I need you to know that I'm sorry and, and to ask for their forgiveness. You know, I, my son doesn't remember me yelling at him one time when he was four or five and I'm thankful that he didn't, but he does remember me saying, I'm sorry. Um, and that's, you know, those are things that we, we, we have to teach our children that we model it. So I think that's how we've done it. At least in our household, our kids are pretty much rule followers. So there are things that make it, easy to parent them in that regard um but at the same time that that also presents the whole issue of how do you how do you balance being a rule follower without raising up a bunch of um uh, self-righteous or or goody two-shoes who are more inclined to follow the rules than to be compassionate Mm -hmm. and so um so, you know, just learning, learning about my kids, learning who they are, what their personalities are, and, and, and finding out how to parent them individually rather than thinking <clears throat> that things are going to be the same. And there are times when both of them have said, you didn't do that with, you know, my brother or my sister. You're right. You're a different person. And so the rules are different, um, not based on gender, not based on, you know, any of those types of things, but just based solely on the fact that you are a different human being. Yeah. Um, and the way we parent you is going to be different than the way we parent uh, you know, your sibling. Yeah. I've, I don't know if this saying applies, but I've heard, you know, you treat them equally by treating them differently. Yeah. It's such a great, great statement. I mean, my, my daughter loved playing soccer from the time she was four. And so she, she played until uh, an injury finally shut her down uh, when she was 14 or 15. Um, 
but at the same time, when we put Brock out there on the soccer field, you know, the little, little mighty mites, four-year-olds, you know, sort of thing, uh, it, it was pretty clear that this was not going to be his thing. He wanted to lay in the grass and look for four-leaf clovers or look at cloud shapes and all of, and all that. And so <clears throat> um, that, for me, quickly became recognizing that I have a son who's probably not going to be interested in sports the way that I am, and we have to find different ways to connect. And then I hear I had this daughter that's all about sports and we joke and call her the soccerpedia because she knows everything there is to know about women soccer players. <laughs> some of it, some of it, she knows way too much. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but here they are just very, very different. So if we went to a, if we went to, to go to a, a football game or a basketball game or something like that, we had to make concessions about how each of them would experience the day. Right. Yeah. So uh, so yeah, you parent them equally by parenting parenting them differently. I love that. You know, I think I think I had a preconceived notion before becoming actually becoming a parent of basically imposing my own will on the children. And I've realized through conversations like this because I've had a lot, and I really love that I have a podcast platform where I get to ask successful parents how they parent because I'm I'm learning. It's that. Um, you know, that it is getting to know them, getting to know what they're like. I'll tell you what, there are a few things that gross me out more than bugs and spiders and insects. But my son, like, it's it's his thing. Like, the other day, there was a salamander just stuck on his finger hanging off. And I'm like, ugh. But like, that, you know, he's into this thing. And so I'm like, I'm into it now for him. And I'm just learning what, you know, what gets him excited and what gets my daughter excited and, um, and, 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 and trying to meet them where they're at, right? Instead of, just throwing what I want all over them. I've learned that doesn't work out so well. So I appreciate your perspective on it. Well, I had it, I had, I learned this lesson pretty clearly watching a friend of mine in Charlotte. Uh, we worked together. Uh, he had three absolutely beautiful daughters. Uh, I've, I've done uh, two of the daughter's weddings. One of them unfortunately passed away in college, participated in her funeral. Um, and just these amazing, beautiful girls. And if you, if you know their dad, he was a, he was a um, athletics director for Cabarrus County um, Parks and Rec. He was the activities minister. So he ran all of the leagues and, and all of those things. So he is Mr. Sports. Mm -hmm. He was at App State in the seventies and he was the, he was the guy in the fraternity that did the, the craziest, wildest stuff. Right. So he is everything that we would look at. And, and some will remember nostalgically with a phrase like a man's man. Sure. Other people would make, make, may, may describe that as everything that's wrong with masculinity. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right? But, but that's the person he was, you know, as, as a college student, young, young adult type thing. Uh, and so he shared with me one time, he said, my daughters never showed any interest in sports. And so he invested himself in the local playhouse where they wanted to be. They wanted to do theater and musical theater. And so he's had, he's led tour groups to Broadway. He's, he was building sets at the playhouse for the entire time his daughters were there. I mean, uh, that became a community for his family. Uh, and he said that, you know, I just, I, I knew that they weren't going to be sports people. And so if I wanted to connect with my daughters, be with my daughters, be an active father in their lives, then I had to go where they were. Absolutely. I, you know, I'm, I'm really focused on personal growth, personal development. And I don't think there's ever been anything in my life that's given me a better opportunity to grow personally than being a parent, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's, and it's, 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 it's a lesson in, in patience every day. It's a lesson in communication. Um, it's there. I'm every single day I take something away from it and I mess it up every single day too, which, you know, at first I put a lot of pressure on myself, but now those simple words, I'm sorry that you said mm -hmm. earlier, and a, a guest I had on, Doug Stewart, a few weeks ago said the exact same thing. I asked him his parent ph parenting philosophy. He said, I'm going to do the best I can. And when I screw it up, I'm going to say, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. We used to joke with our kids saying we can save for college or we can save for therapy. Which one do you want? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you've you got, you've got to pay for one of the two. <laughs> and, and they would laugh at us and think, oh, what do you mean? We're going to have to, or like, we know we've screwed stuff up. Yeah. I mean, uh, we all do, right? Right. So you know, okay, so um, let, let's let's sidestep for a second. So sure. um, we were talking about your your friend from uh, that had the three daughters, has mm -hmm. the three daughters, and um, man's man masculinity. That's another thing right now. You know that toxic masculinity. I think how um, 
I can't say all men. I can't, I don't I can't even say most men, but there are some men that kind of embody that, that typical toxic masculinity that I don't necessarily um, fall into that lane myself. Mm -hmm. um, I do enjoy, you know, some manly things, but at the other times, I'm probably not considered much of a man's man. Um, where do you fit into all of that? Um, yeah. Well, well, I mean, you know, part of the whole thing with the toxic masculinity piece is recognizing um, kind of the benefits that come to us as men, right? I mean, that are just afforded to us. So you might even call it like male privilege. You know, sure. we don't like, I don't even think about being sexually harassed. Not right. that anybody would want to do that to me, but I mean, you know, <laughs> I, don't even, I, don't, I never have to think about that. I never have to, have to think about if somebody uh, judging me based on my appearance um, is, 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 are my, is, my, is my skirt too short? Is my blouse too low? You know, those types of things that I see so many women have to deal with. And I think that's part of where the toxic masculinity piece comes in. And, and, and to be aware of it, I think, keeps us out of that lane. Yeah. Um, I, I still screw up, you know, I, I, I'm not going to suggest that here and say that I'm a beacon of virtue. I still mess up with some of that from time to time and make some assumptions. But, but when it comes to, you know, building stuff, which seems to be, you know, the man's man kind of thing, this is, this is what you need to do. I'm terrible at it. Same. Um, my father-in-law could build a house from ground up w oh. without, I mean, he just, he just, he just had it in his head, but, but he never finished high school. And so here I come along and want to marry his daughter. And I grew up in the city and I don't know the first thing about farming or building or fixing a car or any of these things that he ascribed with doing an honest day's work. Mm -hmm. um, yet, no, no, I, I <laughs> no, not happening. <laughs> you know, YouTube has been the best thing in the world for me because oh, I can, man. I can watch stuff and figure it out, but to just go and do it and, yep. and kind of inherently understand how to do it. No. Same. And I don't know if this is the case for you or not, but like I'll watch YouTube and, the guy describes it in 45 seconds, says it'll take 30 minutes to do. And I'm there four and a half hours later, like, you got to be kidding me. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> this yeah, just I've, recently I've... happened for me. I was building a planter box. We we're doing a little garden. It seems like, you know, we're on lockdown. I think everybody in the world has started a garden in the past couple of weeks. But so uh, I was going to build one. And literally, it probably would take somebody that had any sort of carpentry skills whatsoever. Maybe an hour, maybe tops for what I did. It was a five hour job for me, easily. <laughs> five hour job, my wife just laughs. She just brings me a drink in the middle of it and says, keep going, honey. <laughs> you're, you're doing great, sweetheart. You'll get there, babe. She knows I'm good at other things. <laughs> right. But yeah, the nice thing about that is that it's supportive, but it's also slightly patronizing, but you oh, know totally. that you're loved. <laughs> so totally. that's, that's the key. Yeah. Well, and, and I can take it, I get it. It's not me, I get it. Right, right. Um, so what about, um, okay, so I'm just jumping around here because I, I like having these conversations with you. So, you know, um, what about leadership? So how does, how does like your parenting philosophy mm -hmm. fit into the work you do with coaching and teaching leadership and community involvement? Like, are those things interrelated? What do you take from one and bring to the other? Talk to me a little bit about, you know, what leadership means to you. Yeah, I appreciate you phrasing that as what do you take from one and how does it influence the other? Because I'm not sure that I could distinguish how much of parenting has made me a better leader, manager, whatever the case may be, versus, and how much of the management coaching piece has made me a better parent. Yeah, I mean, I, I coach my kids a lot. And I know that is specifically because I've done coach training and, and because it's part of my leadership style. Um, and I think sometimes that drives my kids crazy because they sometimes they just want an answer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but as far as what leadership means, I think it, I mean, there's, there's so many different directions you can go with a definition like that. I, for me, ultimately it, it's about empowering those around me with the capacity and the confidence to do the things um, that they're called to do. All right. And so uh, if, if I have somebody, uh, if I have somebody that works with me or works for me and they clearly are gifted in something that I am not, I want to encourage that. Yeah. Um, I want to, and not only just to encourage it to, so that they can sort of, you know, use this, this little phrase about live their best life or, <laughs> or do their best work, but also because I want to encourage their voice yeah. to recognize that I see how important what you, your contributions are. And I value your contributions and not just your technical contributions, but, you, but your perspective, your voice, 
your opinion, all of that matter because I have blind spots. Um, and as a leader, if I'm not conscious of my blind spots and if I'm not humble enough to say, um, I need your help, then I'm going to fail. And, and I'm going to, and I'm going to make everybody else around me miserable while I do it. Yeah. I love that. Empowerment, absolutely. Blind spots, self-awareness. These are things that um, I'm hyper focused on right now for determining where mine are. And mm -hmm. it's weird. I'm almost going to, I'm going to have a hard time bridging this gap or segueing into this, but like, I want to talk about race. Sure. And especially as two white men, I want to talk about race and I don't like, it almost makes me nervous because I've never had to talk about race before. I definitely am not going to say the right things or I'm, I realize my privilege in this whole thing, but I don't want to be quiet any longer. Mm -hmm. And um, so noticing, becoming self-aware and noticing my blind spots when it comes to that has been kind of hitting me over the head with a, a, a hammer lately. It's something mm -hmm. that's really just been like, okay, I can't, I can't not explore this any longer and try and figure out where my unconscious subconscious prejudices lie because I know they're there and I didn't choose to put them there, but all of a sudden, like I'm, I'm, I'm becoming more aware of them. Um, I don't even know if I specifically have a question about this, but you know, what, what have you been feeling through, you know, recently there's been a, you know, I mean, it's always happening, but recently we're, we're going through some pretty um, sad times with race relations and, um, as a white male, what do you feel is your biggest opportunity right now to, to contribute to progress? I don't know if that's a good question or not, but that's what just came to me. Uh, yeah, it's, that's a tough question. Um, be, because, um, to, hmm, let me, let me answer this way to listen and, and to try to understand the experiences of others. Uh, I mean, I, I know that as a white male, my voice uh, is more likely to be heard uh, because a, a system is, is, a friend of mine calls the, he, he says we don't really have racist people as much as we have people who have been influenced by a racist system. He says in the entire, so much of our culture is built on these uh, racialized assumptions. Um, and so, so because of those assumptions, it, it's more, you know, so here's, here's a simple story. I, I got pulled over one time um, by a, a county sheriff uh, for what he thought I had run a stop sign. And I knew full well that I had, and I, but I also understood why he was pulling me over because, because of how the situation sort of unfolded. Um, but when he walks up to the car, he says to me, uh, you know, he's all tough and bowed up, and he says, do you know why I pulled you over? And I said, I, I, know, why, I know why you think you pulled me over, Right. I never gave thought to what his response to me would be right until I was recounting this story with some, uh, some friends of mine who are people of color. And, and one of the guys just cuts his, gives a side eye to his buddy. And he's like, he'd have pulled me out of that car in a heartbeat. Yeah. I believe right. That. And I was like, you know, you're absolutely right. In, in thinking about it, I'm now aware that, that, that there's just another layer of privilege that's, that's popped up. Um, as much as I try to be attuned to it, I'm still slapped in the face by it time and time again. Um, so, so I get back to the place that I started the answer, which was to listen. I need to listen to people's experiences that are different than mine and figure out how to lend my voice to theirs. Uh, I don't need to speak for them. Uh, I don't need to, to be this grand advocate that plays into my ego, but I need to listen and support and follow. Um, I think that's one major piece. I think another piece is uh, advocating in a way with other people, other white people, to break down this idea of what white privilege is. I think privilege is such an economic term. So if I grew up as a poor white person and you tell me I'm privileged, I'm, I'm immediately going to turn the conversation off or I'm going to become defensive. Yes. And I get that. Um, so I also need to listen to, to folks who are on that side of the conversation to try to understand um, what, the, what the barriers are, what their concerns are, what their fears are, quite frankly, um, because we all have them. And I think it's oftentimes our fears that create our biases. Um, 
and, and they may not necessarily be fears that we could articulate, right? Uh, you know, I, um, but, but they're there and, and they're there for some reason. Um, I, I, you know, I saw an article the other day and the guy said, uh, the, the woman writing it said, right now my son is cute, but at some point he will be viewed as a threat because he's an African-American boy. And, and at some point he will go from being cute little boy to a threatening adult male, right? Um, and, and it's just, an, it's just this, this bias that exists in some people and we don't even understand why. And I think that's the work that we have to do is understand what our biases are, uh, listen to those who have them and listen to those who have experienced them. Yeah, oh, that's a good answer. And I appreciate that. And I know I, I didn't really have a, a, uh, a great direction with that other than I want to, I want to have more conversations like this. And if mm -hmm. I want to, you know, practice what I preach, so to speak, I want to be authentic and I want to have conversations that, that make me a better person and exploring this is something that I've never felt called to do before until mm -hmm. now, until now, and really figuring out, okay, what is my position in all this? How do I, I don't know, how do, how do I do something? How do I not just you know, like I, I'm, again, I'm not going to have a, I'm not going to be able to say this in the best way, but just because I'm not, you know, I'm not racist doesn't mean that that's helping the cause. Right. It's like, I, I forget how to, how to say that perfect bestly, but just because I don't, you know, cause I'm not outright doing things that are racist activities doesn't mean that that's, that's okay for me right now. Yeah, I mean, it's, 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 so that goes back to sort of the recognizing your own privilege in the system, right? Yeah. It's like, um, how do I make sure that other people have the same opportunities that I do? How do, um, and, and that, that doesn't mean go and get on a flame war in Facebook. I think, yeah. <laughs> I think that's actually one of the more destructive places this conversation tries to play out is that when, when people try to educate, and I put that in air quotes, one another on Facebook, really it comes down to conversations. Yeah. Um, you know, when you can see people's hearts or hear people's hearts, when you can, when you can see compassion in their face, when you can understand different things about what, what drives their behavior, I think that's a huge piece. I think for me, one of, one of the places that's become really important is, is recognizing when um, those biases are at play in a comment by somebody else that, that I'm close to, that, I, that I've earned the right to, to, to challenge. Yeah. So, so if uh, a sibling or an in-law or a cousin or a close friend or whatever makes a comment that has some pretty, not even, not, not even necessarily significant overtones, but just enough, but to say, hey, can we unpack that for a minute? Because they may not even be conscious of it. I mean, I think about the things that, that, that I, so, so there will be times when I will, um, just out of the nature of who I am, lock my car door. Uh, and, and if I reach across and lock the passenger side door and I happen to see a person of color on the sidewalk, my first reaction is crap. Did they, did they think that I locked the door because of them? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so what does that say about me as I'm trying to explore and unpack this? And it's recognizing that, that my own awareness of it is what has to continue to uh, evolve. It has to continue to be explored because I'm never going to get it right. Um, no matter how many times I try to have the right conversation, I'm still going to screw it up from time to time. And what I've been fortunate enough is to have some, some African American friends who have been willing to let me screw up and say, yeah. I don't know that I would phrase it that way. <laughs> yeah. Maybe what you should say, <laughs> yeah. uh, but that, but, but that's not something that's happening on through digital means that's happening through a conversation right. where they're, where they're putting their hand on my shoulder and saying, brother, don't, I, I understand your heart, but, but don't try to say it that way. <laughs> That's right. I'm, I'm, I, well, I appreciate that. And yes, I'm lucky and fortunate to have that too. And so I think, I think the biggest piece is having the conversation and knowing that, you know, we're going to screw it up, but, but having the conversation, at least that's where I, I want to begin. So, you know, in your, in your conversation that you're happening, I mean, like, that's how we met. I mean, not exactly that way, but through conversation, having a cup of coffee. Um, I think we connected on Twitter mm -hmm. 12, 13 years ago, somewhere around there. Um, probably the last time I was really active on Twitter, just to be honest with you. However, um, you know, you and I both were, were relatively new to the area, I think, mm -hmm. and both had a desire, still have a desire to help our community to really build up this, 
this Raleigh community. And um, we connected through that. We've been friends ever since. Um, and so your 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 love for the for the city, your love for people, that's what really drew me to you. And I think that um, that's probably what's kept me, you know, really wanting to keep having these conversations with you is just I just I just really enjoy it. How, Right now, what is your role as far as your your work goes, as far as profession goes? Can you talk a little bit about that and how how those two are connected? Sure, um, and that's those are that was very kind of you um, to say that. Um, so, so I had two roles at Campbell. Um, uh, one is as the director of community engagement and leadership for the university. Campbell's whole um, mantra is about leading with purpose. Um, we're a small, historically Baptist college in Eastern North Carolina. Uh, still over 30% of our students are first-generation college students. So, so we are still serving that rural and underserved um, communities throughout the state in some, in some pretty amazing ways. Um, with that said, it became our president's um, real initiative to try to make sure that we continued to serve those communities. Uh, to recognize that. Uh, but a part of that for us also meant that as a university, we needed to be a, the best anchor institution in Harnett and surrounding counties that we possibly could be. So, so our community engagement strategy is really about more like a place-based community engagement. It's, it's, not about what, it's not about what Campbell can do to lead the county. It's where can we come alongside and partner and lend our uh, our assets, whether they be, you know, human assets or whether it be knowledge capital or all of those things in partnership with agencies like the United Way or Harnett County government or all those pieces. And so, so that part of my role is about helping the university and the people within the university find avenues to which they can do really um, important community building work. Um, Harnett County is one of the fastest growing micropolitan areas in the state. In other words, moving from rural to suburban slash metro. Uh, so, so there's this huge culture clash that's happening there. So, yeah. so if we're not present in trying to uh, build community goodwill um, to, to participate in efforts of community building, then we're not being a good institution for, for, for the area. But at the same time, we want our students to develop that DNA so that wherever they go, they realize how important it is to be engaged in their community as well. Heck yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. So that's one part of my role. <laughs> <laughs> Just a part. Uh, yeah. The other job title is um, I'm the director of the center for church and community where we're working. I think I mentioned earlier, we're working with clergy and congregations to figure out how to better improve their communities. You know, if, if I can be, if I can be church nerd for just a minute, please. Bring um, it. <laughs> when Jesus taught, he, he often said things like, uh, the kingdom is here, but not yet. And so, so that, that meant the present time and some undetermined time in the future. And, and I think all too often um, our churches have spent so much time worrying about that undetermined time in the future that they haven't paid attention to what's happening in the here and now. Um, and, and that's a broad brushstroke. I recognize that. Uh, so, so what we try to do is help churches think about ways they can be significant uh, partners in their community to do what we're trying to do as a university in our community. You know, how do you, how do you come alongside and do and address things like food insecurity, or socioeconomic uh, issues, or economic development? I mean, you have these tools in your church. How how can you use them to make the community around you better and lift up opportunities for people? So that's the second part of what I do. I love the, that. The, they're pretty related. Yeah, I can totally tell that. So how, um, so with all of that going on, are you still as active in the Raleigh community as you have been in the past? Is that still something that's important to you? It is. Um, you know, one of the things that we talk about at Campbell is asking our students to unpack their bags while they're there. For four years, Harnett County is going to be a significant home for you. Unpack your bags while you're here. Well, I have to unpack my bags when I'm at home as well in Raleigh. I mean, this is my community. There are things happening that are important to me to serve on local boards or to volunteer in different places is important. And to make those sort of human capital connections, um, you know, whether they be really deep relationships with a person or a deep relationship with an organization that I can support, uh, th those are, are, are really important. Um, I mean, they have to be. 
that's for me, right? I mean, I, I can't do I can't do my work and then compartmentalize it and not do it um, in, in my home community as well. Right. So, how do you has has building relationships always been natural for you? Is that something you're just you believe is innate and you're just born with, or is that something you've had to work on? Because I feel like you're a connector, and I feel like you do that at least from what it looks like with ease. Is that the case or not so much? Yeah, I, I, um, I think it, I think it comes easier for me than it does for some people. Um, and I, and I like the phrase you use to be a connector is that I, I really, one of my favorite parts of my job is connecting people to one another who have similar passions and saying you two could really benefit from having a conversation or, or there's something you can learn from one another, or you can teach this person that, that that's really important. Um, because I think that contributes to their sort of flourishing as well. You know, I, I can't meet everybody's needs, but, but I might know somebody who's doing something that I just think is really cool. And then I meet this other person over here and, and I'm like, Oh, the conversation you need to have isn't with me. You need to be having that with Chuck. <laughs> um, and I love that. And so that's part of what fuels getting to know people and, and learning a little bit more about what makes them tick. Um, I, I am not that type of connector that, or that, that type of relationship builder that just, I, at least I don't think I am. I don't, that, that real exuberant kind of in your face, like welcome to the party kind of person. I'd rather sit down and have a coffee and learn more about what makes you tick. Um, and, and uh, I've, I've, I think the people who can make everybody feel at ease and welcome at a party is a great skill as well. <laughs> I kind of wish I had that, but you know, sometimes I'd rather stand in the corner and just have a conversation with two or three people. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but yeah, I think it has come a little bit more natural and, and watching that in my own children has helped me to, to understand that as well, because it comes very easy for my daughter, not so much for my son. Interesting. Yeah. I, um, I've said before on here that I think I learned it. I, I think that there was a time when I was, when I was growing up, I was, was very insecure. I was very overweight as a child. I, uh, um, was picked on a good bit. Um, my, my parents split up when I was younger. My mom remarried. There was all this stuff going on in me that made me go within, I think. And it wasn't um, conscious or wasn't aware of it was happening. But when my mom remarried to my stepfather, who's been my dad for 40 years now, he was that kind of person. And we lived in a smaller town where, and he sold uh, cars for a living, where everywhere we went, he knew somebody and he didn't just know them. He knew their kids. He knew when they were graduating high school. He knew when their birthday was. He knew that Johnny scored a touchdown in the football game last week. You know, he knew all those things and it just flowed and it was natural and it wasn't a sales pitch. It was just who he was. Mm -hmm. But because of that, because of building those relationships, he was, he built a business from it. But it was, I think I just saw that happening because I remember so many times having conversations when people would come up to us in a restaurant or he'd go up to them in a restaurant and I was always embarrassed by it. I was like, dad, why are you doing that? Like, just let them be, you know, why do you got to be that kind of person? And now it, 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 that's who I am. It's mm -hmm. so funny. I just became that. And, and I love doing that too. I love connecting other people. I get way more excitement when I can help two people that have these great ideas or great things going on that could really collaborate and benefit from each other. I love so much bringing them together more than I like if I were involved with it and had anything to do with it. It just, it gets me way more excited. Yeah. I mean, I can, I can accomplish a whole lot more in this life if I'm connecting people who can do it better and faster than I can and with yeah. more passion. Like I, I love the next sparkly thing <laughs> yeah. that makes work hard sometimes because I'm always focused on the next, you know, shiny object. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's recognizing that because of that, I am, because I'm fascinated with this, the next shiny object, I'm also able to figure out who it is that, that that's passionate about that object that's and, right. and build this sense of uh, who could benefit from more conversations together. I think the key thing that you said though about watching your, your dad over all those years and becoming that, I think whether it's something you, you learn or whether it's something innate in you, it all boils down to authenticity uh, and, and the genuineness of, of who you are in relationship building. Um, it, it doesn't matter how you came about that. It's about, it's about how genuine you are in the process of it. And I think that's the difference. I mean, there are a lot of people who are very good at, at sales uh, and, and schmoozing and that sort of thing, but they, but you, they just make your skin crawl. Yeah. Right. We, we've I, all met I them. Met and, them. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, I, I have a good friend that works in uh, the security industry. He, he does the, the internet protocol behind cameras and all that integration stuff for major retailers. And he, he can work a room like nobody's business, but at the end of the day, he's genuine and he's mm-hmm. probably, he's probably not been as successful as he could be if he were willing to play a different game. Um, I mean, and, and that's always struck, stuck with me that, you know, we, we used to run a lot together when I was, when I lived near him in Charlotte and, and occasionally he would come back from a, a sales conference and he would just kind of lament that he probably lost this contract because he wouldn't take this group uh, to the strip club because that's just not what he was going to do. He, he wasn't going to put himself in that situation and it, it probably cost him some, some, you know, revenue from time to time. But at the end of the day, he, you know, he could look in the mirror and, and sleep at night <laughs> yeah. um, because he didn't, he didn't give into um, something that wasn't genuine to who he is. I, I don't, I don't care if any of your listeners are out there taking people to the strip club or not. That's something they got to figure out. <laughs> right. <laughs> if it's what they want to do. So don't let me offend any no of you. No judgment. <laughs> right. This, but, all my but, listeners are strip club people, just so you know. <laughs> but it, uh, trending with that demographic, are you? <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, that's most of my population. <laughs> But yeah, but I mean, it, it mostly was about he had his values that he was going to stick to come, come hell or high water. And so that, that's the, the point that I wanted to make. So, You know, it's a great point. And I very rarely ever want to talk about, my daughter wants to say hi. Hey, can you say hi to Brian? Hi. Hi there. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. <laughs> So um, I very rarely want to like talk about myself on this because I want it to be, you know, I want to learn from you. Um, But one thing that my wife has always pointed out to me, and I think she says it's one of the things that frustrates her the most, but also is what attracted her to me is that when I'm with somebody or with a group of people, I'm all in and I'm with them. And if, and if, and if we've got dinner plans and this person's in the middle of an important story I'll, I'll be late for dinner. I'll be there and I'll be talking to them. I'll be in the moment. I want people to be seen and I want people to be heard. Mm. I felt like maybe for a long time I wasn't. And so if I, if I'm there with somebody, if we're in a conversation, I'm all in. And she's always like, you know, we're late for everything because you give everybody so much time, but it's what I like most about you at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's awesome. I mean, and, and to have the awareness to recognize where it comes from. Right. But also to have a wife that's that appreciates it, even when it frustrates her. Sometimes. (laughs) Uh, Dude, I love this. Yeah, we could talk like this forever. So hopefully we can again, you know. um, So if people wanted to learn more about you or connect or maybe grab a coffee, they're like, wow, that dude sounds pretty cool. I'd love to grab a coffee with him. What's the best way to, uh, to, to connect with you or to to hook up with you? Uh, That's a great question. Um, Probably, probably email is a good place to start. Um, and I don't, I don't know if you have show notes or, or whatever, but, but my email address, show notes. yeah, it's uh, it's just the letter B, the number four and then M A N B four man and then seven two at gmail.com. Okay. Um, yeah, you have any easy. social media presence that you want anybody to be a part of or is that all top secret lockdown? <laughs> no, uh, uh, my Facebook stuff is, is wide open. It's, it's there. It's a, it's a mix of things that I'm thinking about, things that I'm passionate about work stuff. I mean, I I don't try to separate all of that out. It's just, it's kind of a snapshot of who I am. Yeah. Good. Um, Pretty easy to find just Brian Foreman. Um, Okay. If if they're friends with you, they will find me because we're, we should be connected. So yeah, um, I I think we're still friends. Yeah. Now the Twitter, Twitter, I am active. I mean, I am present on Twitter. I'm not as active as I used to be and I don't monitor it as much, but occasionally I I pop in there, but I, I would say probably Facebook or email are the easiest. Oh man. I used to have a lot of fun on Twitter. I might have to I have to step back in and see if it's what it once was for me. You know, what I've found is that if I could figure out how to only follow the things that give me life, yeah. I would love Twitter. Yeah, uh, true. It's, it's when the mess starts to, to trickle in. I, I just want somewhere that I can have I would, one place that I can just go and have fun. And for me, Instagram tends to be a little bit more of that because you, you can't be quite as, <laughs> um, but if I haven't figured that out for Twitter, if somebody's figured that out, that would be great. That's a good thought right there. Okay, cool. Let me, uh, let me ask one more question before we wrap sure. up. So um, the whole concept of my podcast called Build It Better is about building better relationships, better lives, better businesses, just working on growth, you know, personally, professionally. Is there anywhere in your life right now that you're consciously focusing on building it better? 
Uh, yeah, that's such a good question. And one that I've tried to think through. Um, I, I think for me, it's, it all goes back to the fact that I'm always interested in learning. Uh, podcasts, audio books, those types of things have really become important to me, particularly as I'm driving back and forth to Bowie's Creek. I mean, I have 45 minutes in the car each way. Um, but listening to a, a book recently called Successful Aging by a guy named Daniel Levitson, and, uh, and, and, he, and he talks about the things that we need to do to take care of ourselves mentally, physically, emotionally, that help us age more successfully. And so to, to now be on the precipice, to come full circle, to be on the precipice of having these, these two kids at significant life stages, uh, you know, what am I doing to, to be prepared for that next chapter in life? Um, we have always talked about each phase of our children's lives has been a, a different chapter and we don't, we try not to look back with nostalgia. We try to, to be present and to look forward. So how do I continue to do that moving forward? And that's recognizing that my goals professionally and personally have changed from when I was 25, when I was 35, <laughs> here, here I am a few years from 50 and my goals are different. Um, and that that's okay, but it's not just about me. So are my wife's goals. You know, she, she had professional goals at 25, but she's found that as she's balanced family and children and professional that, that are different as well. And so how are we continuing to build our relationship together so that when our kids are gone, we're not sitting there looking at a stranger. Wow. Um, so, so this, and, and quite honestly, as intentional as we try to be about it, this pandemic has really helped us deepen that you know, with the daily walks, with the conversations, with, with questions about what are your, what are your goals after all this? What do I want to have learned from this? And so it's constantly trying to, to build on that. Uh, and, and so that is both a personal and a professional uh, endeavor, right? Absolutely. Um, so, so I think that's, and, and that requires sort of the self-awareness piece is like, okay, I've, I've not arrived. Uh, I'm, I'm probably not ever going to arrive. Um, mm -hmm. But how do I keep, how do I keep striving towards my goals that I'm constantly reassessing to make sure they're the right goals. Yeah. I, I, I don't need to win at capitalism to have a, ha a happy life. <laughs> I don't need to be the first millionaire, billionaire, trillionaire, whatever the case may be. Um, but how do I, how do I make sure that I'm, I'm flourishing in, in understanding what I need and what I want and what I value? That's a great answer, brother. Probably one of my favorites, if not my favorite. And um, I don't think we're ever going to arrive. I think it's, it's about the journey. So let's just enjoy it and keep growing. All right. Glad to be on it with you, man. Brother, thanks so much. I really appreciate your time. and I look forward to you and I uh, chatting again. Absolutely. Anytime. Thanks, Brian. If you've liked this video, please like, leave a comment, and subscribe for more great content. And if you've got time right now, check out one of these super cool upcoming videos.